can we get out of studying the Bible? That's what we'll talk about today. God wants to communicate with you in the 21st century. He wrote his message in a book. He asked you to come and study the book for three compelling reasons. It's essential for growth. It's essential for maturity. It's essential for equipping you, training you, so that you might be an available, clean, sharp instrument in his hands to accomplish his purposes. So the real question confronting you now is how can you afford not to be in God's word? Howard Hendricks. Today we're going to talk about the book, 10 Principles for Studying Your Bible by Charles F. Stanley. The idea behind this book is trying to allow us to see what studying the Bible will give us. How will we grow? How will we know God's thoughts better? And so I thought we would talk a little bit about this. I still have the goal of doing a chapter per day Bible study starting next year that will go over this template. We'll talk about who's in the chapter, what the main points are, and then tell the story of that chapter. I hope that it's slow enough so that you can go through and read along with me. So this book seemed like a good way to start in finding out what it is we need to learn from the Bible. He says that this is a way that we'll get a foundation with God and get the answers we need, and that our life will be changed based on studying the Bible. He says that it's easy for us to wonder, why does God let this happen? Why does God allow pain and suffering? How come we found ourselves in this position? But when we read the Bible, we see a lot of people who feel a lot like we did, where Moses was wondering, how did I get here? Or people who were like, Jonah, I'm out of here. I am not doing this thing. And wondering where it is that God put these people and how they found their way to being part of God's story. And we learn, we understand better when we read the Bible. I mean, think about it. When Moses and Jonah and Ezekiel and all the people who faced things in the Bible were there, they didn't have a text to read necessarily about what to expect. But we do. And so we have that advantage that God is speaking to us and letting us know more about him. He says that when we read the Bible, we'll realize that we will be challenged and struggles will come up in our lives. And we may even be set up into certain situations. So we're there. Sometimes I think about about where I live. And I wonder, is it possible that God has me living where I do? To be a witness, to be someone like a Jonah who can tell people who doesn't really care about God more about him. So when we read the Bible, we'll see that people were set up in those situations so they could be in the right place at the right time. Maybe a little bit like Joseph, where he was sold into slavery, but because he was there, he saved the people of Israel, saved his family, and he was able to do those things because of the path that God led him. And so by learning other people's stories, we'll find out more about our own, about how God leads our lives and sets up certain structures and to be part of his story too. He says that once we get into the word, he says that we have to have unconditional surrender. We know that when we see times of war, when someone surrenders, they give up. They give up their goals. They give up what it was they were trying to achieve. Sometimes they give up more of those things. But surrender means that we're saying to God, every decision is yours, every day. And that's one of the things we'll learn when we read God's word. And when people surrender to God, it shows you that you need God. You know, Moses spent a lot of years not knowing God, not knowing who he was, not being a part of God's people. But then when God called him, he had questions. He didn't necessarily think he was qualified, but he surrendered to God. When we read the book, we also recognize how God calls people and God's voice when he calls people. And so the Apostle Paul got called, he said, to do something he didn't want to do, which was to become a Christian, leave his study, and go to what he considered to be the other side. And when we also listen to God's word and surrender to God, We recognize what we're doing, our own pridefulness, our own rebellion, and how we can come back into line 
with God's decision instead of being willful, like Jonah, not doing it, and instead do what it is that God wants us to do. But just remember, he says that God wants you to be a part of the story. And the devil may tell you, you're good. You should do what you want to do. But God is telling you, you should do what I want you to do. And I think of it this way. You know, people hate that. I think they hate the idea that God is going to tell them what to do. But when Satan tells us what to do, it can be damaging to us. Have you ever met like two families, right? One family has a strict set of parents and the parents are looking out for the kids and making sure they go to school, they do the right thing, they treat people with respect, they learn the things they need to do. And then you have other kids who run wild. I was kind of in that era of kids running wild. But those kids didn't get discipline, they didn't get structure, they maybe don't know how to act in an adult way. And then when it comes time for them to be an adult, they don't know which way to go. I think of it a little bit like that, where when we turn to Satan, Satan is that character going, nah, you just do what you want. It's fine. You should just be who you want to be, boo-boo, and do the things you want to do. And God is like, I'm the person who created you. I know you better than anyone else. I see the possibilities of your future. Do what I say, because I know how this will go so that you have a perfectly amazing life in me. He says that we should also study the Bible so we can be the best that we possibly be. Because again, he knows us better than anyone else. And the things that we know about God and we would learn about God when we are studying the Bible is who he is, how he acts, the way he loves and forgives people. And that will teach us how to transform ourselves because we'll know what it is God is looking for us. And he gives the example in the book that if he gave you $50,000 and told you you could do whatever you wanted to do with the money and you just decided that you were going to stuff it away and just forget about it, you wouldn't do that. You would want to invest it either in something like a stock or a bond that will make you more money in the future, but or maybe you would want to invest it in your life. You would want to buy a house or you'd want to get a suit and some education so you could get a better job. But one way or the other, you would want that money to be working for you. And in a sense, there's nothing more valuable than the Word of God. And so are we going to be the kind of people who we just read it and leave it there? Or are we going to take this valuable thing that God has given us and invest it in other people and in our own lives? And he says that Satan blinds people to the truth. Tells them, you can decide for yourself. Remember Adam and Eve, he tells Eve, you want to be like God, don't you? You want to know everything. That's what the devil tells you. But what God is telling you is that he hopes you invest his word and build it into yourself so that you have the treasures of heaven. Not only that, you grab everyone else and give them the treasures of heaven too. He says that it teaches us how to have a relationship with God and what the right path of our relationship is. He says that it's our guide. I always think of the Bible when I first became a Christian as God wrote an owner's manual. And he did so in a way that was examples, stories, related topics, so that we could know how to live and also how not to live. This is a user manual written by the person who created us. Think about when you buy software and it comes with a user's manual. Don't you wish it told you more? Don't you wish it told you how to use the software better? But in this sense, God gave us the Bible as our user manual to know how to live, how to not live, and how to treat other people, and how to have a relationship with him. Charles Stanley says, too, that when we read the Bible, it turns our grief into peace and joy because we understand that God is with us every step of the way. We know that God is the source of our peace. The word shows us where we're struggling and where we're failing so that we could come back in line with the manual. Imagine a robot that decided it wasn't going to oil its joints and then it seized up. You'd say, that's a stupid robot. He should have known to read the owner's manual. Well, same thing for us. We should know. We also know that the word of God helps protect us. It gives us strength. It gives us hope. And it instructs us how we should live. We know what we should be doing in order to fight off evil, 
and to live in a way that God has asked us to live. And that way, it's not good enough, I think, just to read the Bible, but then that last part where we start applying it. Again, the robot reads the manual and sees that he needs oil, decides he's not going to use oil. It's one thing to understand what it is God tells you you need. It's another thing to go then and do it. He says, too, that reading the Bible will help us hear God's voice because we see how God talked to other people, and we will learn what God's voice sounds like. We'll learn the truth of how God says it. We'll learn to trust him in bigger ways. You see people in the Bible, and it just boggles me and blows my mind, you know, when people like Abraham drop everything and go do this thing, or Matthew, stop doing what you're doing and follow me. And really, all the apostles, wow, that was a big leap to just drop everything and follow God. It will teach us to have that kind of trust with Jesus. And then we'll see examples of where people didn't trust God, didn't follow through on the thing they were supposed to do. And he mentions in that way Peter versus Judas. We can see examples of what happens when people who fail. I mean, Peter failed, Judas failed. But what was the difference in how they reacted to their failure? We can learn how to apply that lesson in our own lives. And it will give us guidance in our principles of how we should be living our lives. The Bible will instruct us so that we know what we should be doing day to day and how we should be treating other people. Whenever I get mad or I think about something, I think about that passage. As much as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. That's not a direct quote, I think, but that's the idea. And so when I have a conflict, my thought is, how can I live with peace with everyone? It's an instruction of how I treat people, and I get that from the Bible. He says the important part is that we have to hide God's word in our heart. And I didn't really know what that meant. I I mean, I've heard the passage and the phrase before, but he goes into this whole chapter of it where we're putting God inside our heart where nobody can get to it. And that way it will make us feel certain of God's love and his protection. We will be bold because now God's word is in our heart and that we know he always has our back. He always gives us hope. And no matter what Satan, what the world, what anything does, we know that God is there with us. And so it will also give us contentment and peace so that we can, he says, quote, take a deep breath and relax. Because when we have God's word in our heart, that will show us how to not be broken by what goes on in the world. Again, I always joke that I was a pan millennialist because I understand in the end it pans out. And so whenever times cause me to take pause, man, you look at the world today and how could it not? I think. God is at the helm. It will be okay. He says that we have to open our hearts to God's truth so that we can understand his voice again, understand his goals, understand what it is God wants us to do. And by reading the Bible, listening to the word of God, we will get there. We will hear what it is that God is trying to say to us and how he's trying to transform our lives gives the example of Mary and Martha. I love that story, and everyone loves to talk about what their view of Mary and Martha is. But the idea is that someone wanted to sit at the foot of Jesus and listen to him, while someone else wanted to do things. And it's not that, again, as everyone says, that doing things for God, being busy, is a bad thing. Being busy and active is a good thing. But at the time where God is going to be in your house and speak to you, it means that you have to listen. And he says, quote, he wants to pour into your life. If you accept his invitation to come, he will give you his peace to stand guard over your life. God in the end wants to talk to us. It's a communication and a relationship. And God wants us to do that. He says, too, that when we read the Bible, it'll help us apply the promises to our lives. God gives a lot of promises in the Bible. Some of them are to individual people. So you have to be careful because he was promising, like Abraham, you will be the father of a great nation. 
It's not telling us we're going to be a father of a great nation. You have to look at the context of the promise. But a lot of times the promises are conditional based on something we do. He tells us to tithe, but not because he wants our money, but because he wants to bless us. He wants us to be faithful, not because he has a thin skin, but because he knows this is the best way to live. And he wants us to be trusting in him because it'll give us joy and comfort. And he wants us to follow in the direction he sends us because it will be surprising and it'll be amazing the things that God will allow you to do. So by learning about God, reading about him in the scripture, it'll give us that kind of connection. God is talking to us and now we're listening and making that relationship. So by reading the Bible, we will be closer to God and follow a better path. Because while we can go wrong, God will never go wrong. And sometimes God might say, take some time and pray about it. Or sometimes God will say, I am here for you. Give your life to me and I will take away your woe. He talks a little bit about how promises to God. It's a little bit weird how like we can ask for something for God. You just don't pick a promise out of, he says, out of the word and say, do this for me. You know, make me the leader, make me the Solomon of our age. God has a plan for you and it's specific to you. One of these times I'm going to get the quote, but in the book, Prince Caspian, C.S. Lewis saw this in a really interesting way when Aslan was running with one of the kids on a horse he, the kid was like, well, how come you're doing this for this person and not for me? And, and Aslan, being the role of Jesus, says, because that's his path. I'm on your path. And somehow, God knows a way to make all our paths work. So you can't go around and look at what God promised other people. You can't go around and look at what God has given other people. But instead, you should say, I surrender to you, Lord. And this is the part, I think, where you pray for surrendering, where you want something and you ask God for it because God asks us to ask for things. But you have to realize that, first of all, is it really the right thing? And secondly, is that really God's path for you? So reading the word of God will help you know a little bit better about how you should pray, what you should pray for, and what kind of answers you'll get from him. He says in the end that we should trust God, obey him. We see all sorts of people where they were faced with frightening things. Elijah, when he was up against Jezebel, I mean, that had to be horrifying. Jezebel was a piece of work for sure. And he was scared. He ran away at first, but he came back and he did what God instructed him to do. It's not that we're not going to have worries. It's not that we're going to be great all the time. But when God's word is restored to us, we'll understand he's there for us. We should trust and obey him. And he will bring about the change he wants. He wants us to be about the story, but the change is his. He brings out those changes. So when people think, I can't witness to these famous people, they would never listen to me. It's God who's working in their hearts. Reminds me of that kid who went around and talked to all the Hollywood stars telling him about Jesus. He understood this is not his action, it's God's action, and he could talk to anybody. That's pretty bold. Charles Stanley says that we should be faithful in prayer, bring everything to the Lord, and meditate on God's word, which means rumble around in your head. Think about it. I think sometimes when I read the Bible or I study the Bible or I read something, I'm trying to get done with something. I'm trying really hard not to do that in this podcast because I'm trying to read this book and get it out there and digest it and then tell you about the book. But instead, it should have an impact. When I read scripture, when I read how people describe scripture, people who are more learned than I am, tell me what things mean. I should mull it over more. I should consider it more. I think that's why I want to do this Bible study early next year because I want to do it slowly so I can let it sink in and I can take each chapter at a time, do a deep dive on it, 
understand the real story behind it. As I've been doing this podcast and I read through some of the chapters in the various books I read, I go, wow, I didn't really gather that when I read it before. So this time I want to really gather everything. Hope you come along with me. But that's where this meditation, this rumbling around God's word into your mind, that's what I'm really hoping for us in this Bible study. Meditation, said it before, is not like Eastern meditation where you empty yourself. This is about filling yourself with God's word, again, rumbling it around in your head so that you can have that close relationship, you can get a sense of peace, but also you get that clear mind, he says, that when you focus on God's word, you're focusing on the right thing. And when you do that, it'll give you the maturity, it'll give you the calm, all the things that you need to go through your day and be a person that God will use in the story that God is building for himself and for all of us. That is the last step, is about taking God's word, growing from it, growing our actions from it, and making it a part of our lives. He says, a sense of peace that is founded not on human knowledge, but on the unshakable truth of God. Isn't that what we all want? So I thought this book was great. I thought it gave a lot of food for thought about why Bible study is so important. And it excites me about doing a deep dive next year, hoping that we could all learn a little bit more, but then also gain all the benefits that this book provides. If you're interested in this book, I recommend that it's a way to show you the whys of doing a Bible study and learning more about the Word of God. So my challenge to you is write down four goals that you would have in studying the Word of God. What do you hope that you would get out of it? And on the promises of the Bible, do you feel like you will get those things? Does God promise that you will get those things? This will give you a lot of whys on studying the Bible. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend. You can find all of the ways that you can subscribe to the podcast on smallstepswithgod.com. Also, I have another podcast, if you haven't heard, which is Start With Small Steps, and it talks about better living through productivity tips, technology, ways of thinking about things that I invite you to listen to as well. And remember, our path of putting God's word in our heart starts with small steps. Small steps.